Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second session of the symposium. To deliver our third talk for the day, we have Dr. Prasanna L.C., who is the professor and head of the Department of Anatomy in Kasturba Medical College. He finished his MBBS from AIMS University of Mysore in 2002, after which he did MD Anatomy in JJMC Medical College of Davangere. He also has DNB by the NBE New Delhi, which he got in 2013. From 2008 till 2012, he worked at JJM Medical College, Devangiri. And from 2012 till date, he is working at Kasturba Medical College. He is here to deliver his speech on body donation. Before the talk, talk starts, I request everyone to put their phones on silent. Thank you. So can we have a stage? Good afternoon to you all. Uh, of course, it is uh, very difficult in a way for a teacher to call upon all the uh, student members, especially for this kind of uh, symposium. Uh, the two in a post-lunch session, of course, it is difficult, isn't it? Uh, I don't want to uh, uh, derail from the topic of uh, today's discussion. So I just observe here, here we have some interesting topic that sir and the department arranged for your benefit. You need to know something. See, what do you mean by the body donation? There are several questions arise in our mind. Why this person came to express about body donation? Yes. Now we need to talk about what is the meaning of body donation, why we need to donate the body, then who is the best person to donate the body, then how we can donate the body and also when we have to donate the body. See these are all a few basic questions arise in our mind when it comes to the body donation. See please remember. Body donation is nothing but an act of one's body voluntarily. Means the person who is willing to donate the body after the death, that too for the benefit of the mankind. So that is the meaning of body donation. It is an act of donating the body after the death for the benefit of mankind. How he is going to benefit? Yes. Government of India, when they framed this amendment as the body donation program, they specifically mentioned that body has to be utilized only for the medical research as well as the education. Now I say this is the sacred gift that if we wanted to give it for the benefit of the mind, how, how you are going to say it is a sacred? See morning we had a discussion and blood donation, isn't it? See, again, we say every donation is very important for us. See, if you donate the blood, definitely we can save one person. And if you divide that constituents, definitely you can treat three to four diseases. Next talk is on organ donation. See, organ donation is once again 
the voluntary act to donate the organ that is not after death just before the death means when the doctor designated that person as the person is brain dead still he is on a ventilator still he is in an hospital only that person is able to do that organ donation yes if we donate the organ definitely we can save eight persons who are critical illness but now you say then what is the meaning of uh, then why you want to do this kind of body donation after the birth after the death who how it is helpful for us see organ donation as well as a blood donation definitely helps to treat the patient but how this will help for the benefit of man yes please observe here these donated bodies will be given to the medical student about 15 to 20 students will be allotted per cadaver or you can say the body the medical student will dissect the body layer by layer and they will come to know what structures are present in which region again they will identify any structures or any deviation from the normal anatomical position is there for an substance or you can say structure X they will identify all the things see please remember here the knowledge he gained by doing the dissection in the first year that has to be remained till his lifetime that anatomical knowledge will die only after his death till that time a doctor has to keep this knowledge again see when he is keeping this kind of knowledge and treating the patient imagine 20 doctors will come out after studying the dissection of one particular body isn't it imagine if a doctor treat nearly 10,000 nearly it's a very minimal amount if he treat 10,000 patients in his lifetime imagine that body gives a knowledge for 20 doctors so imagine 10,000 into 20 minimum 2 lakhs of patient will be getting benefited by that cadaver isn't it then isn't it it is not a sacred so imagine in some of the cases among these 20 doctors some of them they become or they go to the super speciality or they will become a research scientist and if they find out any important or innovative surgeries or the treatment definitely isn't it a, a gift given by the dead person for the doctor isn't it so that's why we use that word sacred gift given to the human being again are you going to use this cadaver only for undergraduate teaching no we are using these cadavers even for post graduation studies and to conduct various workshops you know already the workshop will attract so many doctors from different parts of the world and they will carry out innovative surgeries on the cadaver because if you want to do any innovative surgeries or a new year surgeries it is not permitted on the living person you have to do in the cadaver okay so by sharing those knowledge definitely that will help other doctors also to learn all these innovative surgeries or the updated surgeries so this is the benefit of donating the body history of this body donation can be date back to the Puranas so if you observe there was a Rutrasura a Daman who wanted to take control of all the three worlds then he wanted to take the position of Indra. Indra is considered to be the god of, isn't it? He is the head of all the gods. He tortured all the gods like anything. Then in such one case, the Shiva, he told, you go and request a Maharshi called as Dadichi and ask him to donate the body voluntarily. Once he left the body, you can take over the bones. From the bone, you can make a Vajrayuda. So, Vajrayuda was prepared by the bones of Dadichi Maharshi. That is a powerful weapon. 
he told why because the dichi maharshi bone or the cells of that person skeleton was almost more harder than the diamonds okay so that's why we consider dadichi maharshi was the pers first person okay who gave an impression of body donation to the mankind next after that we came to the several centuries like for example around uh, herophilus we say he was considered to be the father of the modern medicine so during that olden period it was not allowed by anybody to do the dissection of a human body so during his time in that is in the greek or in the latin so there the emperor will give the body of a criminal to dissect the and to observe or to notify the human anatomy only the criminals were given to the physicians of greece to study the knowledge of anatomy that's why if you see our medical terminology all those words are coming from either greek or the latin language next after what happened 18 to 19 century there will be a rapid surge of medical college across european country so in such case what they will do definitely there will be a scarcity of the human body and these persons are not allowing to dissect so then what they did see it started the body snatching see the body snatching means see they will give especially the medical colleges will give uh, uh, they will try to find out one agency to give some um, uh, people for a dissection isn't it so that agency they will contact the criminal or you can say the person who is with a criminal background and ask them to bring some person for a dissection so observe that body snatching leads to the killing of lots of innocent people on the street and later on what the grave robbery started means immediately after the burial the next morning that body was not or that corpse was not there in the burial site the reason is they will immediately take out and the night itself and they will hand over that body to the medical college for dissection so that is called as a grave robbery next it comes to the burk and hare method this method even it mentioned in the forensic medicine what these people they almost killed 16 people within a 4 to 5 months this burk and hare they run uh, uh, an hotel business whenever the person will come to his hotel they give a, a welcome drink for them when they intoxicated they will smother so they will kill that person so like that they procure all these cadavers in the olden days so that's why what they did so to avoid all these or to prevent all these type of heinous activities or uh, the acts of gaining the pro uh, cadaver procurement there is started called as an anatomical act across the world so the first act was established in united kingdom that is called as a murder act they say you can take over the body of a criminal you can dissect it you can study the normal anatomy and the next comes massachusetts acts usa in 1831 that says yes you can take the body of a criminal to study as well as for the research purpose also means you can do some of the research from that tissues obtained from that criminal the later on we have an indian act called as bombay anatomy act established in 1949 so this bombay anatomy act was amended and it will be distributed throughout the country means across all the states so each state now we are having the bombay anatomy act that says you can use the cadavers upon the body donation or the unclaimed persons for medical research or the education okay so this is how the uh, acts will come then 
So that completes what is body donation. Again, you may ask one question. See, all bodies are same. Why can't you use many cadavers per year? Because all human structures are same. So dissect only one person body and you can show it to all the students. What is there to dissect so many bodies? No. Please remember, each one of us anatomy is different. If a, if a structure running in this direction may not be present in uh, Yogendra sir body. Means every person anatomical structure is completely different. That's why we are giving more number of bodies and we need more number of bodies for dissection every year. Then why you want to do the body donation? I already explained with one body donation it almost create 15 to 20 doctors and some of them become super specialist. So almost everyone is able to treat the person, isn't it? So that is the need and also please remember whether it is a medical, dental, Ayurvedic, whatever may be, even the allied health sciences, they say the cadaveric teaching is a mandatory for the uh, curriculum, isn't it? And also, please remember here, we need around 25 to 30 bodies per year for the dissection, demonstration, research, as well as even for preparing the museum specimens also. So, this is why we need to donate the body. Then, who is the suitable candidate for the body donation. There is no hard and fast rule that only this person has to donate or that person has to. No, it is not like that. The person after 80 years of age, anyone can give an is willingness for a body donation. Because that 18 year is a mandatory in the government of India to take decision on his own. So after 18 years, anyone. And death due to natural causes. Natural cause means anybody, even that age also, or even some of the communicable, non-communicable non diseases also. Communicable means, as you know, spreads from one person to another person. Non-communicable means all these diabetes, hypertension, and various other medical illness. So all these persons, after the death, definitely they can donate. These are some of the areas or the conditions where we can accept the body for a donation, but these donated bodies are not going to use for the medical purpose. See, autopsy bodies. Autopsy means the person, if he died because of unnatural causes, maybe because of strangulation, heart poisoning, whatever it may be, so that person will not be given or handed over by the hospital authority with, without any incision. They have to do multiple incision. We have, they have to take out some of the organs to send for the toxicology. Some of them have to send for FSL laboratories, like that. So once we dissect, the normal anatomical structure will hampered. We need the cadaver. Why? Because it is almost like a lifelike condition. Isn't it? Then only we can take. But if you incised in autopsy, definitely it is not going to use. Then removal of organs and tissues. Again, in if the person is considered as the voluntary organ donor. See, some of the organs, especially the liver, pancreas, kidneys were taken out. Again, to take out all these, we need to make an incision. Once you make an incision, definitely that person is not suitable for the undergraduate medical teaching. Okay, that's why we are accepting, but they are not going to help. Then you can ask, then why you are taking that body? Is it for selling purpose? No. We are making these kind of condition for making skeletons. Have you observed? Have you come to our museum? There are so many skeletons are there. Those skeletons are made from these autopsied bodies. Then we have some condition like extreme obesity, of course. It is very difficult for a dissection, but we accept. Extreme emaciation in case of chronic illness, either cancers or tuberculosis and all, the person is going to emaciate 
like anything yes still we accept that body decomposed body see definitely we can accept for skeleton making purpose but they are not going to help for medical teaching so okay except the first two the other three are not useful for medical teaching again there is a class one can say i have donated the body i am the do body donor so after the immediately after that you have to take means the institution has to take all the responsibility no there are some condition we though you are a body donor we cannot accept what are those for example a patient okay while writing his dying declaration or uh, he considered to be a body donor in such case he was healthy except some small illness but once he got hiv is it possible for us no because that person has to be handled by many students and even our non teaching faculties for embalming and exam for example recently covid the exact the pathogenesis of it was not known during that case so they mentioned clearly don't take the bodies if a person died from the covid because we don't know exactly how many hours or how many years or how many months are under what condition that virus has to survive for and for how many isn't it so that's why we have not received these kind of bodies next how to donate the body so it is a simple we said after 18 years of age anybody can give his willingness either you have to call to the anatomy department or in the hospital there is an help desk if anybody want to show his willingness definitely we are giving a form you can see that form has uh, the details of that person along with the four witnesses among the four witnesses two witnesses are mandatory from the close relatives and two other like a friends why why these relatives are needed definitely i am ready to give the body donation but again my brother or my wife they may not willing to give isn't it so that's why we need to console our family members before accepting as a body donor so that is the need of taking two witnesses from the family so after this we will give an acknowledgement letter as well as the registration number here observe i have not registered as a body donor but in the hospital when i see my close relative is about to die with a chronic illness and the doctor told that it's impossible for him to get back to his health condition in such case yes we can donate because a person who is on the bed definitely he can voluntarily ex express his willingness so during that time a relative can call anatomy department or the help desk so definitely they will have that is also there and only we can uh, register as well as given uh, are considered to be a body donor or sometimes the patient died in the hospital or in the home also but the relatives want to donate for the social cause yes during that time also even if you are not a body donor we need to send a representative from our department as well as the non teaching faculties to deliver those forms as well as to do the embalming to get that body back okay these conditions are also possible next okay you are received you have received already the body of a donor then what the department will do so once we receive the body we are doing a process called embalming with the 10% formalin we are injecting through the major vessels or the great vessels about 5 liters of fluid so why 5 liters as you know already our 
circulatory system has almost 5 liters of blood, isn't it? So, if you send the 5 liters of formalin, all that blood as well as its constituents, they will come out and the entire body, the vessels as well as the tissues are completely infiltrated with the formalin. Formalin is a fixative as you know. It preserves the body like a life-like condition. All the tissues will be preserved. That is the reason of doing embalming. So, once they fix with the formalin, so now they will be stored in the formalin tank. Are you going to use it immediately? Okay, you are doing that embalming process now. Are you going to? Yes. Sometimes, depending on the situation. Normally, here, because of a beautiful knowledge about the body donation, we are receiving maximum number of donors. Every year, almost minimum of 90 to 100 people, the great people will give the body donation to our department. Every year, because of maximum uh, amount of awareness, especially in this coastal belt. Then, we are using those bodies in the previous year, because we need to keep immersed at least for another 4 to 5 months. As you know already, the 10% formula is enough to kill almost all the viruses, bacteria, parasites, whatever it may be, if they are present in us. So, even they say 2% of formula is enough, but we are using 10% just to kill almost or to make ensure that almost all the uh, microorganisms will be destroyed with that concentration. Next, after complete, see, the body, then uh, many of us uh, body donors will ask, okay, I am giving the body donation. You are dissecting and you are making use of that knowledge, especially to the medical field or undergraduates and the research. But after that, what happened? You are dissecting the whole body. Are you throwing? No. We have given maximum respect for a body donor. Every year before the commencement of first MBBS or before making any incision or the uh, incision on that body, we are calling a few representative from the relatives. It is not the close relatives of him only because we have a long list of body donors. So, we will pick only two or three families and we will call them and in front of all the delegates and the first year MBBS student, we give maximum respect for that cadaver. Then we will start doing the dissection. That is the beginning. So, after the completion of dissection, by the end of one year, we will once again pay a respect by the first year MBBS student as a closing ceremony. Then after that, we are pack means taking out all those body parts and we will give it to incineration. Okay, this is what uh, we are doing for the body donation. Next, there are some scenarios. For example, a donor passes away at home, what you will do? See here, definitely the relatives need to inform to the department, preferably within 4 to 6 hours. The reason is, after 4 to 6 hours, all that blood constituent gets stagnated. Means all the veins and the arteries, they are clogged. They Even if you infuse the formalin, that formalin will not go to the circulatory system. That is why it is preferred to inform the department within 6 hours after that death. Then, we need a two certificates. One is the death certificate issued by a family doctor because that person died in the family. Next, a letter of confirming a body donation means this is nothing but acknowledgement letter given by our department if he is a body donor. Okay. So, these two certificates are mandatory. Again, why that six hours? Apart from this circulatory system, there is a blockage of circulatory system. If you wanted to donate that cornea, we need to take out that cornea within 4 to 6 hours. That is also another reason 
uh, for all our uh, um, like uh, uh, donors we are telling this information you need to inform within 6 hours next the transport facility will be provided by the institution s yes. our institution is so generous even we have conducted this workshop a long back if you uh, like it's impossible for us we got so many like calls from across the state see we are here uh, people from almost Bidar, Gulbarga, Bangalore, they are willing to donate that body to KMC Manipal. But the problem is, see, we many a times, it's not possible for us to send for such a long distance. Preferably, our institutions say, 60 to 80 kilometers, they can send that ambulance or the transfer, uh, transport facility. If it is beyond that 60 to 80 kilometers, definitely, they have to bring back that body, we will give that amount, whatever the amount is there towards the ambulance, like uh, uh, ambulance and all, we will give that, we will provide that. This is what happened if the donor passes in the home. And again, see this last paragraph. They say a small part of the body can be given for religious purposes. Many a times, again, we do respect a, a very religion. Some religions say, yes, my father donated his body. But the problem is, we need to do some rituals. Otherwise, we may not get a good blessing from our elders. Yes, in that case, we are giving a small part of the body, especially the great toe or the thumb that can be given for the religious purposes. In this scenario, see, the donor passes away in the hospital. Again, in this case, a death certificate is issued by the doctor. There we have a family doctor or a regional a doctor from the regional hospital. That is enough in the previous case. But here, the doctor or the consulting patient himself give it death certificate along with the acknowledgement letter given by our institute. Those two certificates are mandatory. Again, the body is shifted to the mortuary. Again, see, please remember here, we are not taking that body directly to the anatomy department. The reason is, the person died in the hospital, it has to go through a, a protocol called as a legal document. Means that person body has to go for a forensic medicine, the forensic medicine has to approve that, yes, you can take over the body, then we will take that body like that. Okay, so this is about uh, the donor if he passed within the hospital. Next. Refusal by the relatives. See here once again, we do respect the decision of family members as I said. There is no legal action. Suppose they are the voluntary body donator. They gave that body donation, received every registration, everything. But in the end they say, I am not interested to give. Yes, it is your wish. Because see, the body donation is a voluntary act. In the end, if you if you say, I am not giving, definitely, we are pleased to hear. We will respect your wishes. So, we are not taking. There is no legal bound for this body donation. And also, it is not like only after the death. In case, if we are a donor, before that death, if you change any time in your mind, no, I am a body donor presently, after a few years, I say, I am not giving. You just give a letter, I am not willing to give that body. I am just wanted to retract or delete that registration. Yes, we are happy to do because it is your wish. That is also possible. Next, if you see, there are some misconceptions roaming everywhere. That is common in human being. See, what are those? You just observe. 
somebody will ask all private medical college hospital can take away or can voluntarily participate in body donation that is false means all the private colleges they don't have the permission by the government of uh, karnataka here they do not because if at all uh, uh, a private institution want to have this kind of voluntary body donation program they must consult the government of india first it has to be approved by the gazette then only that private medical college is considered the body donation program next the organs will be removed from the dead person and distributed for transplantation some some definitely say oh why you are giving that body man so if you if you give that body donation definitely after the death they will take out some of the organ and they will distribute or they will sell it to other no after the death those organs are not at all useful for transplantation except cornea that to within 4 to 6 hours even if you take out multiple organs that is not at all going to benefit because transplantation is not possible in all the cases so again that is wrong again the question is when multi organ donation has been done the body cannot be accepted for body don i told you already when we are considering the suitability of a body don isn't it see i say i am already a body donor okay if i am a body donor already some some person will say i cannot go and ask anatomy department to accept me as a body donor organ donor is separate here already an organ donor but they say is it possible for me to enroll as a body donor in your department yes that is possible but as i said once we remove that organs it is that body is not suitable for anatomic dissection or an undergraduate or postgraduate medical teaching but we can use it for skeletal making that's all and the second this all also post mortem bodies yes you can donate but they are not going to help us this question my family will be charged some some uh, some of the relatives they came and asked me okay now i am giving the body donation you are accepting it but after that you are sending the ambulance everything and you are doing some procedures like embalming and other thing are we going to sub give that money for it because someone will definitely have this kind of questions in their mind so please remember whatever the cost born either for the transportation or for the embalming procedure we are not at all add any or we are not at all asking any money from the donors next an history of medical illness will prevent me from becoming a body donor so that is false because only a very few medical condition automatically disqualify from a body donor. that as i said covid for example hiv so like that so we don't know exactly in future what, what uh, such diseases will come to us so definitely according to that that a pandemicity of that disease we can ask the government opinion whether to accept it or not they will take the uh, decision in the end here recently we got a this case that great person already around 92 year but still he is very fit he came and asked me sir i wanted to donate the body but i am already 92 at present is it possible are you going to accept my registration yes see that age is only for your mind not the body because he was such a fit person we said definitely all those assumptions were false so you can register for voluntary body donation next see here if i am an organ donor i can't donate my body to science for the research see he is an organ donor already but see here the fact is it's wrong for example see this question i am just trying to simplify it 
see probably i am i just want i am just al- already a body do- uh, organ donor i am just thinking okay now i am interested in body donation also but the problem is see once i gave uh, all the like eight tissues from my body i am not going to be useful for a medical teaching isn't it so that always make something bad in my mind so that i am talking about my condition so yes whatever you are thinking is right but the problem is here you are a board, you are an organ donor see organ donation will help you to save the life you take that as a priority if you are an organ donor already you take that priority as a first to save that 8% life later you think of body donation so this is the answer next here also some misconception almost from several years ago they said if i am an voluntary body donor if that incident or if the hospital authority knows about this kind of t- issues like he is already a body donor when i go to the hospital they will take out all the organs and sell it no is no medical colleges or no hospital in this world will do this kind of worst things they always try to give their a best life back to you rather than to kill you okay this is the false conception so these are all some of the basic like questions we got in our mind what to what is body, body donation who are all the selective donors or uh, how to donate everything we just in a brief we mentioned so in just i wanted to conclude this see please remember body donation is an act of our willingness to donate one's body after the death for the medical purpose again if we donate the body definitely our friends and relative will will uh, uh, distribute that information to everywhere so that awareness become more and more and definitely it will be more helpful for that society again it, in a family they will say the surrounding people are in a people in a village they say they are the body donor that person family is donating the body so definitely you will get some uh, encouragement then your gift will allow for better health care as i said that will definitely try and make some 15 to 20 good doctors per cadaver so this is what uh, the body donation means so i just wanted to brief this all of you or many of you are already aware of the map museum of anatomy and pathology just i wanted to bring here a two or three slides to express what it is see it was set up in 1953 by dr ss godbole sir he is not only an anatomist but also a good artist and a good hunter have you seen have you seen the map when you enter into the map we can see so many animals isn't it so all those animals were procured by him as well as his non teaching fellows so he beautifully dissected all those see our museum has nearly uh, 3000 plus specimens and we are arranging in both anatomy department as well as the pathology sections like that and please remember almost all these organs were kept in a systems like gastrointestinal system circulatory system like that so all those specimens are arranged in systematically at present in map out of that 3000 we displayed around 1134 dissected specimens and 541 belong to the animals so such a beautiful museum is considered to be one of the asia's best that is because we followed 
the specimen preservation it is quite different and also all those jars were made from german superior glasses and the only thing is why we kept it open because to import or to uh, give some uh, awareness about the body system as well as the related diseases to the community that's why and again we are conducting frequent workshop for the biology teachers in and around udupi just to create awareness so please remember annually we received almost more than 2 lakhs of visitors but in 2020 and 21 the number is less because of the covid we restricted for 2 years almost and once again here you just go through this map kmc.manipal.edu if you go to this url it will shows a series of system that means we are digitalizing the museum for the benefit of the teachers as well as the student across the country and the world so recently we almost uh, 100 core specimens were selected and we digitalized this process as the pilot project again this project is helped to uh, develop an anatomy museum as an innovative and educational tool so later on we are trying to digitalize the rest of the specimens also you just go through this you will see the systems once again if you if you click on the system it will shows how many specimens are available if you click on each specimen it will show you the details of that specimen so definitely it's a, a wonderful uh, online tool for learning even you can use it or when you go to the map there is a qr code you can click it and you can store it and you can open whenever you want so this is what our museum uh, uh, provides you as a best learning tool so that almost completes uh, my talk about uh, a body donation and please observe here these are all some of the reflections given by the medical student as i said every year before the beginning of the incision on the cadaver we are conducting atcom series attitude ethics and communication for the student during that time we are giving a series of lectures as well as the importance of body donation and these are all some of the reflections given by the student in the end see i will never know the love that filled your heart but you taught me the chambers of your heart that once flowed with the blood of life these are all the same exact words taken by our reflections only see the muscles i will never know the feeling of your friendly embrace but you taught me the muscles and the bones with open arm upon seeing the brain they said i will never know the thoughts and memories that shaped your life but you taught me the anatomical foundation what it mean to be alive next upon seeing the muscles of the thigh and the leg they mentioned i never i will never know the steps in your life you have taken but you taught me the liver mechanism how to take a shape again the face upon dissection they say i will never know your face or name and yet i have met you and i will remember you forever more than anything you have taught me humility altruism and higher respect for human life these are all the reflection given by students only at the end of the atcom series that is cadaver as a teacher so this completes uh, uh, my a brief talk on the body donation if you are having any queries you can ask me thank you
In US, there is a practice of, uh, there is a person called a coroner. Ah, so they prepare the body. Yes, sir. So, what exactly is that they do? Is Coronas? It, uh, yeah. They, they prepare the body and again if they inject uh, the body with certain embalming fluids. Yes, sir. Hmm. So, how is it? Is it different? No, sir. Now, now, see, if we prepare the body, like we are using that formalin as a fixative, common fixative. But nowadays we have, a, a, but that fixative causes more of stiffness. We do not flex it. We do not flex the vertebral column and the skin texture, it turns to be more of black in color because the formalin. So to avoid all those things, we are having a several modern embalming fluid. So nowadays we are working on a different project to make the skin even it has to retain the same color of a patient. And also we have developed some embalming fluid so that we can, after the death, after four to uh, six uh, months after death also, we can flex like this. So that is definitely help for uh, the orthopedicians when they are performing the surgeries and spine surgeries and hand surgeries and all. We are developing it and also many a times when we are injecting the fluid see we have two systems arteries and veins lymphatics they do not it's impossible for us to get in such case they will definitely they were using a certain dye through an artery that imparts red in color through a vein it has to impart blue in color so like that sir and also even there are many many more methods are available it almost appears to be like a living person even we are also trying, sir. Yeah. We have uh, developed recently around it's almost a seventh month. Still, we have uh, maintained the flexibility of all the joint, even the texture of your skin, everything. In other countries, since they don't have that uh, body donation also, they are going for all these anatomies, virtual lab anatomy, uh, dissection tool as well as even they are using the plastic models also but there is a separate it, profession in yes, the US that yes. is after the death before the burial yes sir they hand over the body to the coroner mm -hmm. so he prepares the body dresses it up mm -hmm. and then sends it for you know sort of there is a separate course for that not that time uh, that time not aware that I am not sure. <laughs> so I wanted to know, you said uh, there are certain conditions where the body is not accepted for uh, mm. donation. Mm. Say if the person has never been tested for it, never been diagnosed for it, but he, is a, he has pledged for organ donation. Do you also perform any tests before embalming? No, na know? that's why. That's why. Na naturally, we are accepting uh, uh, um, a forum from the doctor, a recognized medical doctor. He has to certify that what is the cause of the death. So, if that person died in the hospital, we had all the records. Uh, so, my doubt was if he is not dead because of a certain condition, mm. but say he has HIV, he has never been tested for it. Mm. So, would that be known before? We, we are we are conducting tests only for HIV and HPSAG okay. here, but COVID and all still we are uh, uh, like asking the patient party only to do all those things. Thank you. Sir. HIV and HPSAG we are doing. Uh, also, sir, uh, we've been uh, reading a lot about uh, artificial bodies being prepared for. Uh, uh, teaching medical mm. students. So, That's what. What do you think are the drawbacks of such systems? No, see, I, I told you, no, uh, it's impossible for us to give the same impression that I am having the body, sir having the same body structure. It's impossible. That is what we call the variation. So that's why we are giving around 12 cadavers for an year, especially for medical teaching and four cadavers for uh, dental teaching. The reason is, they have to study the human anatomy in all the bodies so that they will get to know the variations of a body. Thank you, only when he is aware of the normal and abnormal, then only that surgeon will do that uh, good surgeries. Thank or we expect from good surgeon. Thank you. Okay. Any other applications than studying anatomy? Means, means. So, like, uh, they say artists also use. Do 
donated bodies no it's only for research and uh, this one and now we are started even the plastination also we are taking the body parts and we are shaping it so we are present there is a, a long uh, uh, preservation technique called as a plastination so other than it's not <laughs> thank you Thank you, sir, for that truly really fascinating speech. I call upon Dr. Yagendra Naik to present Dr. Prasanna with a memento. Thank you, sir. Our next talk starts at 3.15. We can break for a 15-minute break. Thank you.
A very good afternoon to all present here. I would like to introduce our last speaker for the day, that is uh, Dr. Archana MV. She is currently the Assistant Professor and Clinical Coordinator for Hemophilia Treatment Center, Department of Pediatric Hematology and Oncology, KMC Manipal. She completed her MBBS in 2009 from Sri Siddhartha Medical College, Tumkur, followed by her MD in Pediatrics from Father Muller College, Mangalore. She was given a fellowship in Pediatric Hematology and Oncology at Mazumdar Shock Medical Center, Bangalore. She has been working in KMC from 2019 till present. We welcome you, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before starting, uh, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity and uh, give me this one hour time to share about hemophilia and our work in the field of hemophilia. I think since morning uh, you would have had wonderful sessions, right? There is a lot of infusion of information since morning. I hope you will get a few more information through this talk. So today's talk, the objectives will be mainly regarding the hemostatic system. That is the how the clot is formed and what defect can happen during the clot formation which will lead to bleeding disorders and how will we diagnose and manage these bleeding disorders. So blood is a fluid that we all know but sometimes it has to be like clot also to prevent bleeding like whenever there is injury to the blood vessel the blood has to solidify and clot, uh, the clot has to stop the bleed this mechanism of uh, maintaining the fluid state and solidification of blood when required is known as hemostasis it is the mainly the balance between the clotting and fluidity of the blood so for the clot formation there are multiple steps Whenever there is injury, there is, uh, there is a breach or uh, rupture of the blood vessel because of which there will be exposure of certain factor which will attract all the platelet that causes the platelets will go to that area and clog the aperture or the dent whatever has become in the vessel wall. But this is known as primary hemostasis. But that whatever the platelet plug which has formed is not strong enough. The, you know it is a fluid which is flowing so fast and the platelets have formed a temporary plug that has to become very strong. That is by the clotting factor. So these are clotting factors are nothing but the proteins produced by the liver which will circulate in the blood as a inact in an inactive form. Because of this injury or exposure of the collagen, these factors will get activated serially. There are so many clotting factors, factor 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 13. They get activated serially to form the fibrin. This fibrin will along with the platelet will form the secondary hemostatic plug which is strong. Same time if this process is not under the check, the clot formation will go on, it can obstruct the vessels, it can go to vital structures as well. So prevent that simultaneously to break the clot, the fibrinolysis system will get activated. So, so many process at a time, right? Such a simple diagram, right? Huh? So we have two cascades, coagulation cascade, fibrinolysis cascade. See, from factor, like these factors will get activated by the vascular injury. Finally, they form a fibrin. Same time, the fibrinolysis pathway will get activated to check on the clot system. Okay, but today 
our uh, concentration is only on two factors. There are 13, but we are talking only about two factors. That is factor 8 and factor 9. So things can go wrong in many steps here. The bleeding disorder can happen due to the problem in the vessel, primary hemostasis, that is the platelet, secondary hemostasis, that is the clotting factor, or at a, or at a fibrinolysis. If fibrinolysis system is very active, then whatever before the clot becomes very strong and stops the bleeding, it will eat away the clots. So the it can go wrong at any level, but in hemophilia, it is secondary hemostasis which is affected. So depending on at what stage the defect, we have bleeding disorder. Mainly it is a vascular disorder like you would have heard of Ehler Danlos syndrome or platelet disorder, low platelet count, platelet function abnormalities or clotting disorder like hemophilia, von Willebrand disease and fibrinolytic disorder. So coming to our topic today, uh, that is hemophilia. It is a most common severe form of clotting disorder and it is a genetic disease and it is lifelong. The most common one is hemophilia A that is due to the deficiency of factor 8. So because of the genetic defect or gene defect, the on the factor 8 gene, the patient is not able to produce enough factor 8 in hemophilia A, factor 9 in hemophilia B. But hemophilia is A is, is the most common one seen in 80 to 85 percent of patients, hemophilia patients. So most of the time if I use the word hemophilia, hemophilia A, I think I might interchange also because it's the most common form. And the severity of disease might vary depending on the how much factor the patient can produce and uh, coming to how it happens. So you know how many chromosomes are there in each cell in human body? We have 43 pairs of, sorry, 23 pairs of chromosome, total 46 chromosome. In that, we the last pair, 23rd pair is the sex chromosome. In males, it is XY. In females, it is XX. So unfortunately, these factor genes, factor 8 and factor 9 genes are on the X chromosome. Okay. If the patient has Females have two chromosomes. If one of our X chromosome has a defective gene also, we are okay. We are carriers then. And we will produce enough factor to prevent bleed or clot to form. But males will have only one X chromosome. So they don't have one more X chromosome to compensate. So they will manifest the disease. So females will be carriers. Males will be the sufferers that they will manifest the disease okay sometimes even carriers can have rarely bleeding symptoms but it is very not very common so this is how it will inherit suppose a carrier marries a normal male okay the right half is the the affected x chromosome this side okay so she can transmit the, there is a 50% chance that she will have one more carrier daughter and 50% chance that she can have one affected son. So mother will, mother doesn't show any partiality. She'll, she will divide among both boys and girls equally. Okay. But if a hemophilia father the person male who is suffering from hemophilia marries a normal girl and if they have kids all males will be normal because father will give y chromosome to sons so they will be normal and his other x chromosome which is affected will be given to the girls so he doesn't give any disease to boys but the but his daughters will be carriers and he can have a grandson with hemophilia. 
So why I showed this is, this is like very important to take good family history. In two third cases of hemophilia, we get family history of hemophilia. Either maternal uncle, maternal grandfather, somebody would have had this hemophilia. In one third cases, it could be due to new mutation, you may not get family history. That's why it's very important to take a good family history and recognize the pattern how this disease is getting transmitted. So what is this? So I think it, is, it has become very monotonous. I thought we'll, we'll have some picture show. It's some royal family, right? OK, next clue. Yes, correct. Huh. This is like Queen Victoria was a carrier of hemophilia B. Okay. She had a son, Leopold. He died at 30 years because of bleeding. Her, her two daughters, Alice and uh, I don't know the name, two daughters were carriers, half shaded circles. Okay. They got married to other royals in the Europe. So some like that, she got many grandchildren with hemophilia. Right? If you see, most of them died before, like at around 20 years, 30 years, like that. So it is also called as royal disease. Okay? So see, look at the family tree. By inheritance only, we'll find out like, okay, this is X-linked inherited uh, disorder, most probably hemophilia. Okay? So historical aspect. Like if you go to like history, in 2nd century only it was mentioned in Jew Jewish law that if a person, baby, male child need not undergo circumcision if two of his brothers have died following circumcision due to bleeding. Understood? So that law was there in 2nd century, means this disease is very ancient. But first case was uh, like they, sh they coined the term, they found out that there is a bleeding history uh, like that. It was only in 18th century it is described. Later in 18th century only they realized by giving blood transfusion you can control the bleeding. Then the Queen Victoria story came and in 1930s and 50s they started separating the blood components. Morning you would have heard, right, how blood is divided into different components. They could separate the plasma and give only plasma for these patient for as a treatment. Later they came across all viral illness, 1970s and 80s, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV. Then they started purifying the factor, started doing viral inactivation to give the factors later we now we have recombinant factors we have advanced therapy for hemophilia that i will talk later okay so it's not very common maybe 1 in 10000 male 1 in 10 in a lakh can have hemophilia a uh, hemophilia b is still low so when we should suspect so i told you two things right Primary hemostasis, that is usually platelet defect. Secondary hemostasis, that is due to the clotting defects. Usually these primary hemostasis patients usually present with nose bleed, dental bleed, oral bleed, superficial bleed. If they cut, small uh, cut happens, they'll bleed. But in clotting factor deficiency, what happens is like this minor thing doesn't bother them much. Okay? They present with deeper bleeds, like joint bleed, muscle hematoma, sometimes life-threatening bleed like intracranial hemorrhage, GI hemorrhage and all. Okay? So, and it can happen spontaneously in clotting disorder. There might not be any history of trauma or surgery. They will be sitting, standing like this and suddenly they can have bleed, especially the severe forms. Okay? But joint bleeds are the classic of hemophilia. Joint bleeds are called hemarthrosis. That is a classic uh, manifestation of hemophilia. And again, the family history will give a very good clue. So, sometime when the umbilical cord falls, the bleed, baby can have lot of bleeds. Cuts can cause bleeds. These are called bruises. 
and uh, these are the slightly severe forms like they can have muscle hematoma they can have elbow hemarthrosis knee hemarthrosis this is the thigh hematoma like that they will present with deeper bleeds if we don't take care of them at that stage they will have repeated bleed and they go into lot of disabilities like uh, chronic synovitis chronic arthritis contracture of the muscle and eventually they they will become wheelchair bound or bedridden so that's why it's very important to identify the disease and treat appropriately so serious bleeds are the joint bleeds muscle bleed life threatening ones are intracranial neck throat and gastrointestinal bleeds we do see like child was playing just slipped and fell like that and after that having vomiting not uh, not consolable crying continuously you do a imaging you see there is a bleed so any hemophilia child comes with vomiting and not consolable or become like very sleepy you no know? we don't image them first first we tell them we will give you the factor treatment then we will image because we don't want to waste the time also it's very important so like uh, what is the percentage of factor they have and how much factor they can produce we have divided them into severe moderate and mild severe forms will produce less than 1% of the normal factor the normal level in us is like 50 units to 1 150 units per dl but here it is less than 1% their factor levels are less than moderate ones are 1 to 5% mild ones are 5 to 40% so severe ones are the one who suffer a lot they can have spontaneous bleed as i told you like sitting standing they can just have joint bleed they can have muscle hematoma they can have hematuria suddenly without any trigger but usually moderate ones will have some trigger but the bleed is disproportional to the trigger if i fall from here will i get a hematoma no right but moderate ones will get a hematoma the mild ones are like they will bleed excessively compared to a normal person after a surgery or a trauma so so many times we miss these mild and moderate they wouldn't have been diagnosed throughout their life they undergo some surgery like appendicectomy tonsillectomy hemorrhoidectomy and post that they'll continue to have bleed and we get a reference that this uh, patient is having bleed we have done a blood test which is showing abnormality so many times it is diagnosed retrospectively but the severe ones usually before 3 years of age will have one episode of some spontaneous bleed like uh, like joint bleed muscle bleed they like they they are very evident uh, some when they come to opd also looking at them only you can see like they would have had some uh, ecchymosis here two three ecchymosis over the legs like they are covered with ecchymosis or joint will be swollen something will be there but unlike severe moderate and mild they may not get diagnosed till adulthood also so this we discussed the most common site of bleeding in hemophilia is joints in that the most common site is the knee joint followed by elbow joint the pictures whatever i show you to you also it is the elbow and the knee other joints also can get involved but commonest is the knee followed by elbow sometimes we can have even cns bleed spontaneous or following a minor trauma so whenever such patient comes to us in uh, kh kasurba hospital manipal we have a clinical proforma which we will fill whatever i discuss so far like uh, we have a uh, bleeding assessment tool in that each site of bleeding will be scored 1 to 4 and we will calculate the total score like suppose you can see epistaxis hematuria gi bleed oral cavity bleed like each type of bleed will be scored and we will see the total score higher the total score 
high likely of bleeding disorder. So many times these bleeding symptoms no, can be subjective also, especially in female of adolescent age. Uh, so many times they'll tell menorrhagia, having lot of uh, uh, this thing, bleeding. But so it, it will be very subjective. That's why we have an objective scoring system proposed by uh, International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis that is called BAT score, Bleeding Assessment Tool Score. So we use that and you can see there is a big column for pedigree. So we give lot of importance to family history. We have our nurse coordinator Dr. Sulochana B who takes for each and every patient complete history, writes the pedigree and then we send it for hemostatic workup. Like we do the screening test first like uh, that has bleeding time, clotting time, PT, APTT that is prothrombin time and activated uh, prothrombin time. Then once the screening test is suggestive of hemophilia means we go for higher tire next stage test. So usually bleeding disorder we evaluate in three stages. First stage is the screening test, second stage is the specific test, third stage is the advanced test. If you usually stage one is required for everybody. With that we will find out whether it is a bleeding disorder, whether it is a clotting disorder. In the clotting disorder we will get some idea whether PT is prolonged, APTT is prolonged, whether we are dealing with intrinsic pathway, extrinsic pathway, we will have an idea accordingly we will ask for the second tire test. Some instance we won't get a diagnosis with second tire test, test. then we will go for advanced testing like factor 13 uh, assessment, platelet function test etc. So in hemophilia, we will have prolonged APTT with normal platelet and prothrombin time. Then we do something known as mixing study. This is nothing but like you mix the patient plasma with a normal plasma and see whether the patient uh, APTT gets corrected, whether the blood gets clots or not. If it gets clot, if uh, suppose the blood is clotted now, that means that he was deficient in some factor because of which he, his blood was not clotting previously with mixing with normal plasma it is getting clotted that is mixing study. If that is positive we go for a factor assay. Factor assay helps in diagnosis whether it is factor 8 deficiency, factor 9 deficiency, same times it can identify the severity. This is a quantitative test. It will tell less than 1%, 1 to 5% or 5 to 40% or out. it is normal. So the uh, confirmatory diagnosis, diagnostic test for hemophilia is factor assay. So uh, after that I am not sure whether it is clear or not. It is by Dr. Annama Kurian who was the previous in charge of hemophilia treatment center who got this format. Uh, it is a comprehensive report. We write how the patient presented, what all the first tire, second tire, third tire test we have done it and we give a comprehensive report. Along with this we give a handout to the pa patient that what precaution he is supposed to take how he has to contact us for any treatment, all these information will be given to the patient. So what information is given, we will discuss now, okay. So you, it's just a bleeding disorder, but still it can affect any system in the body, especially musculoskeletal system. That's why we need multidisciplinary team to manage a patient with hemophilia. Uh, so the management priority for us is like if suppose a patient comes with bleeding, treat the bleed. I am not worried about his disability or his uh, mental health or his social health or nothing. If the bleeding is there, treat it. That is the first priority. Second priority would be that patient should not come back with one more bleed. Prevent the bleed. If already bleed has happened, that should cause minimal deformity or no deformity after that. So rehabilitate him. This is my second priority. The third priority is like already complications have happened. 
like uh, because of repeated bleed, delayed treatment, there is joint deformity, joint swelling, then we go for rehabilitative like joint surgeries, muscle release operations, all these things. And uh, of course, there is lot of uh, uh, what you call the myths involved with hemophilia, especially the mothers who carry the disease, they will be blamed for this disease. The mothers, kids, like, there is lot of social issues that we need to solve. Because these kids, if they go to school also, they might have bleeds, right? And they, they will have lot of absents, absentees in the school. Uh, their academic performance might come down. They cannot participate in sports like other kids. That's why there is lot of psychological issue associated with hemophilia that we need to address. So for this, we have a comprehensive team, including the pediatrician, orthopedician, physiotherapist, nurse coordinator, dental specialist, clinical psychologist. Uh, we do a comprehensive clinic on every fourth Saturday of the month, and we meet these hemophilia patient. All the comprehensive core members will meet the patient. We'll, like Some might require some dental procedure, some might require physiotherapy, some will ask for some, like every, everyone meets the dentist and psychologist. Like their specific needs will be identified and addressed. So coming to the management, initially we spoke like the pre-replacement era. That is, we knew only about the blood transfusion and blood product transfusion. That is cryoprecipitate and FFP. Later in 1950s, 60s, they started fractionating the plasma and started producing the plasma derived factor concentrates. So whenever you have to give a blood, like the amount of factor in the blood will be very less. You need to give lot, large volume blood transfusion to correct the factors. So every time patient has to get admitted for the uh, transfusion, all this problem was there. Later on with replacement therapy, they had a small volume plasma derived concentrate, they could give it at home also. There was an effective uh, control of bleed, their quality of life improved. Uh, and later on in 1990s, we had recombinant factors. Even the plasma derived factor has the threat of viral transmissions. So recombinant factor doesn't have that uh, threat as well. Now we are moving on to non-replacement therapy and gene therapy as well. Gene therapy is like it is successful already in hemophilia. So the, we'll just discuss about how we manage this uh, joint bleed because which is the most common bleed in hemophilia. So whenever there is bleed immediately we will ask the patient or the parent to give rest to that limb, apply ice put compression bandage and elevate the limb. Later on studies showed uh, that by doing just this price that is the short form for uh, that uh, rest, ice, compression, elevation, protection, price, P-R-I-C-E, then they thought they have to uh, put police there, okay, not to guard the joint, OL is optimal loading you have to give the loading of factors then only you can control the bleed and prevent long term uh, chronic problems of hemophilia so it the priority of giving factor has come way 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 near to the bleed like as soon as bleed happens now also from our society also patient takes factor home we have taught mothers how to give factor infusion in it, like uh, they say they develop an aura before they develop the joint bleed. They feel some tingling sensation. They know it's going to bleed now. That aura they'll have it seems. I don't know. I have not experienced. It's like given in books everywhere. So once uh, that aura comes, at the time only, time only if they infuse the factor, the bleed will be prevented effectively. Right? So optimal loading, so police has come, protection, optimal loading, apply ice, provide compression and give elevation to the limb. So optimal loading with what you want to load. 
so previously it was the plasma cryoprecipitate then plasma derived factors now we have recombinant factors okay so what was the problem with ffp and cryotransfusion was how much ever you give you give 20 ml per kg of fresh frozen plasma you could not bring the factor level to normal so bleed was not controlled optimally they still continued to bleed or bleed was not con uh, not controlled optimally so they used to have long term side effect chronic arthritis and all used to develop then they slowly thawed this fresh frozen plasma after thawing whatever remaining on the top part is the cryoprecipitate that was a rich source of factor 8 cryoprecipitate does not contain factor 9 we cannot use in factor 9 deficiency we can use it in factor 8 deficiency that is hemophilia a that was a rich source of factor 8 but still for cryoprecipitate they have like it comes as a small bag of 20 30 ml okay but still they had to come to the hospital take like for a 10 kg child you have to give one or two packs for a 50 kg child 10 packs such packs still the volume was more then they this uh, did this fractionation of human plasma uh, by fractionation of this human plasma they have like uh, now I think they are deriving nearly 25 protein which has therapeutic implication the most common one is IVIG so you would have heard of uh, intravenous immunoglobulin which we use in so many immunological primary immunodeficiency disorder and hyper -im immune serum in hepatitis B varicella and all we use that uh, rabies all these hyper immune serum uh, we can get similarly all the clotting factor can be derived from this by this method known as fractionation of human plasma by this they got this plasma derived factors but what happened in 1980s were la, like blood born infections viral infections so uh, 1985 or some statistics from US shows 50% uh, of hemophilics in US became HIV positive, 80% of uh, hemophilics in US became hepatitis C positive in 1985. So what they did in 1980 that they started pooling the plasma from different donors and started producing plasma reduction derived factor so everybody got the infection that was so sad right huh? because of that pooling of plasma then after that we started screening we had ELISA based now we have nucleic acid based testing for viral infection then donor selection strategies have improved and also we have lot of viral inactivation method like dry heat pasteurization solvent detergent method nanofiltration like that lot of viral inactivation processes have come into picture because of that the viral reaction rates have come down but still there is still a threat of prion disease parvo b19 disease which is like which we cannot uh, prevent by all this purification process as well so but uh, now we have recombinant factors in 1985 they cloned this uh, factor 8 and factor 9 gene in 1990s they started producing recombinant factors so these are the few factors what we get it for factor 8 deficiency plasma derived immunate octanate recombinant ones are advate all these things and factor 9 we have alpha 9 octa 9 repli 9 all these factors but whatever the factor if in doubt treat don't wait that is the strategy because uh, it will help to recover more quickly prevent later damage uh, if you treat late more it will take longer to heal and you need to give more factors and mind you the cost of factor is very high so one unit of factor cost factor 8 cost 11 rupees factor 9 cost 16 rupees for a child 20 kg 
who is coming with knee joint swelling i have there are calculation formulas we will calculate nearly he'll get he needs 500 to 750 units so he has to spend nearly 5 to 7 and a half thousand rupees for one injection and that we have to give some time every 12th hourly for two or three days so it's a very not just royal disease it's a very expensive disease as well right so again if it is a major hemorrhage and life threatening hemorrhage we need 100% correction same 20 ch kg child comes with intracranial bleed then i have to give him 1000 unit that is 10000 rupees every 12th hourly for 7 days okay so it's i'll i'll tell you how we are managing here apart from this like there is like lot of emphasis for prevention not just in hemophilia in cancer in infection everywhere prevention is better than cure so here we know, we have something known as prophylaxis those who can afford those who have lot of factor now they take the factors irrespective of their bleeding every monday thursday they take or tuesday friday they take there won't be any bleeding the principle behind this is what you know they saw severe hemophilics were bleeding spontaneously severe hemophilics are the patient with less than 1 1% factor whereas moderate ones even with the factor level more than 1 1 to 5% did not have spontaneous bleeding with some trigger only had bleed but his quality of life was much much better than the severe ones then they thought okay if we bring the factor level less than 1% to 2 to 3% also their quality of life will increase it will become better so they started giving low dose factors every 2 or 3 days once so that their factor levels need not go up to 50 60% at least 2 to 3% so you are converting a mild hemophilia patient into a moderate hemophilia by that you will improve their quality of life i'm very happy that even this prophylaxis program we are able to provide for few patient because we are getting factors for factors on humanitarian gra ground so few of our pediatric patients whose weight is less than 40 kg are on prophylaxis they are, they are doing doing very well going to school don't have any disabilities and sometimes those who have disability also we give factors for short term like 6 months okay during that we do very good rehabilitation program physiotherapy if required some joint contracture surgery muscle contracture surgery we will correct it good give good physiotherapy by that we will improve their musculoskeletal function so that those who are wheel wheelchair bound will be able to walk those who can walk can do his normal activity so that his uh, quality of life will be improved apart from these factors concentrate infusion rest ice application we do others also like anti fibrinolytic agents we use and these bleeds are extremely painful so good anti inflammatory agents but we avoid nsaid like aspirin brufen and all we avoid we usually give them tramadol paracetamol tapentadol such analgesics and other than that physiotherapy rehabilitation is cornerstone along with psychosocial counseling so again i'll mention uh, we we will encourage all the patient for physiotherapy soon after the pain uh, they their pain subsides to full movement of the joint and it's very important to regain their joint mobility and maintain their muscle strength so still we have some complications like chronic disability inhibitor development psychosocial problem blood borne infection here also we have many zero positive hemophiliacs they are still doing good but still they are on so recently one of our uh, hemophilia patient in india underwent liver transplant for hepatitis c infection also like that it happens so by giving factors can we 
can we make their life e we can make their life easy but still there is a risk of inhibitor what is this inhibitor so it's a protein i mentioned right the clotting factor is a protein you are giving proteins to us to hemophilia patient they can develop antibody to this clotting factor so sub subsequently when you infuse this factor concentrate it may not work because these antibodies will neutralize the proteins so they stop responding to factor infusion chances of developing this inhibitor is 30% in hemophilia a it's a quite huge even we have inhibitors here patients with inhibitor for them we will have to give other therapy so like clotting cascade we saw right there are so many arms in clotting cascade here patient with inhibitor we are trying to strengthen the other arms of clotting so that the clot is formed one of that is FIBA that is factor 8 inhibitor bypassing agent so we give other factor we strengthen the other arms of the clotting but problem is this is more expensive 10 times expensive than factors and we have recombinant factor 7a 1 mg costs nearly 60,000 rupees it's very costly but still we don't have any option if you give FFP it doesn't work if you give cryoprecipitate it doesn't work if you give factor concentrate it doesn't work we have to use either bypassing agent or recombinant factor 7a recombinant factor 7a acts by multiple mechanism and it will help in clot formation so better to like there are few strategy to prevent this inhibitor formation that's what we are following in our unit as well but more fascinating is this advances in management of hemophilia so they just I mentioned you have to give the factor infusion 12th hourly then they thought okay why can't we increase the half-life of factors we have extended half-life factors uh, for factor 8 we can give once in uh, in a day factor 9 we have a factor which we can give it once in 14 days also so later on there are like uh, they found a bi, bi specific antibody so antibody is what it will go bind to one antigen but it is a bispecific antibody what it will do it will it act as a factor 8 go and bind to factor 9 and bring the factor 10 near to it okay this is known as emizuzumab the advantages are even in inhibitor patient we can use it is given as a subcutaneous injection and it uh, and it can be given once in two weeks so long acting subcutaneous, subcutaneous administration no risk of inhibitor even this therapy is available in our society but it is not available on humanitarian ground it has to be paid and we have pegylated fc fusion albumin fusion factors uh, currently we have only one that is aloptes uh, that is a fc fusion factor which is a extended half-life product while talking about this management of hemophilia we should always counsel uh, create awareness among the public and also the family how to prevent bleed so we will give letter to school stating this this child should not be engaged in contact sports indoor games swimming cycling will be encouraged for them and we avoid intramuscular injection we avoid certain drugs like antiplatelet drugs clopidogrel aspirin and all these in these individuals so for this uh, it's like we saw it's so expensive the factors are very expensive we are getting uh, factors on humanitarian basis for free of cost from world federation of hemophilia we are affiliated to that through hemophilia federation of india these are the patient driven organizations uh, helped by or backed up by the medical professionals uh, through this we are getting factors for uh, humanitarian aid hemophilia federation of india is working through 92 chapters spread all across india 
there are seven chapters in Karnataka. We are one of them, Manipal. So recently we got upgraded to hemophilia treatment center. So far we were like because we have a comprehensive team, we are giving holistic care and comprehensive care to these hemophilia patient. We have been upgraded to hemophilia treatment center. Apart from hemophilia, we give, we are trying to give comprehensive multidisciplinary care for other bleeding disorders as well. Our vision is hemophilia without disability and children free of pain. So we have this comprehensive clinic. Uh, you can see Dr. Aram Annama Kurian who was there, uh, who is the one who started the hemophilia society in Manipal. You can see Sulochana Madam and Dr. Dinesh Nayak sir. And we do one camp every year, which is called as Asha Kiran Camp, Ray of Hope for these families. Both the patients and the families will come. Usually it used to be one or two days camp, it seems. Even I have not participated since I have come here, it is COVID. We had a camp this year, but it was for one day camp. So mainly it is, we will, give, we will have educational activities, games, some recreation for these patients. So we give lot of emphasis to physiotherapy. We have a uh, trained physiotherapist who has fellowship in hemophilia uh, related uh, uh, musculoskeletal problems. Lot of uh, emphasis for rehabilitation. We have pediatric orthopedician actively engaged in management of these hemophilia patients. So if we manage these hemophilia patients well, they can do any activities. We have many patient participating in Paralympics and all and also there are so many cyclists, climbers, so many patients like they do lot of activity if we manage them well. If we don't, they will end up, they will be like bedridden, wheelchair bound, will have lot of disability. Before finishing, one thing I want to tell is like lot of awareness is required because with this awareness, we can prevent hemophilia. How? By doing carrier screening. Those who have family history of hemophilia, all the females should get the carrier screening and undergo antenatal diagnosis between 3 to 9, uh, 9 to 13 weeks of pregnancy and decide about the cap, like later what to do, whether to have a hemophilia child or not, like if the test comes positive. So for this, we need lot of awareness regarding hemophilia. So take home messages would be severe hemophilia, they can have spontaneous bleed, joint and muscles are the common site, early treatment, quick recovery, prevent later damage, when in doubt, treat, either with the plasma or plasma deroid or recombinant factor, but uh, the most effective ones are the plasma derived or recombinant factor. Initiate physiotherapy once the pain subsides. Hemophilia is preventable. There is lot of advances going in hemo management of hemophilia. Uh, it, and it is very fascinating. I think most of the hemophilia can lead normal life with this advanced therapies. Thank you. Any questions? Hello. What are the different organizations huh. that uh, support? Uh, Sir, in uh, India, we have mainly this Hemophilia Federation of India, sir, hmm. HFI. It is having lot of uh, uh, like uh, uh, they are giving uh, these factors on humanitarian basis. And also there are uh, uh, government uh, also is providing lot of factor to government hospital as well. There are uh, and it is comes under the disability act. These patients will get pension also as a disabled ones. Uh, and they get free factors in the government hospital also. Though the supply is not very adequate to give prophylaxis or give it like whenever they have bleed at least for the major bleeds government is providing the factors for free apart from this hemophilia federation of india is supporting the uh, all hemophilia patient actually it is a patient driven organization itself 
Good evening. Good evening, ma'am. Yes, sir. I'm a blood donor motivator, so okay. my technical knowledge could be very basic and limited. Yes, sir. Uh, ma'am, you mentioned about a hemophilia patient uh, who had to undergo a liver transplant uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, procedure. So, I somehow I, I have an understanding that uh, the poisonous habits in the liver. Oh, yes, fact, fact he, he, actually liver transplant is one of the treatment for hemophilia. It didn't get much this thing because they bleed so much. For them if they do doing liver transplant and all is a very risky procedure. Because you need to give lot of factors. If you give more factors there might be some thrombus. It will uh, destroy the anastomosis during the transplant all those things. That's why it has not become very popular among Hemophilia. Hopefully, this patient will become hemophilia free after the liver transplant. And, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, is there any role for a hepatologist in the control of? I mean, I don't know, but uh, like this is not the standard of care because when they were trying this liver transplant, I think the first successful transplant for liver transplant for hemophilia happened in 1992 or 93, long back. But by the time the gene therapy came which was more fascinating. So that's why uh, the liver transplant has, is not a standard of care or advised treatment for hemophilia at present, sir. Maybe in future, I don't know. With all these, like, hemost we have a better hemostatic agents now, like emezuzumab, other tissue factor, uh, tissue, uh, factor pathway inhibitor and all. With that, if you can have good hemostasis during the liver transplant procedure, maybe in future it is one of the options. Is it possible to do gene therapy in India? No, sir. We don't have any gene therapy trials currently running in India. There was a trial in Vellur that is closed now. We don't have any active uh, uh, trial uh, enrolling patients. Yes. You had already mentioned about the profile axis, no? Yes, yes. Uh, in that profile axis also, they are giving clotting factors. Yes. So, twice or thrice per week <laughs> okay. it is mentioned. Huh. So, that too is costly, you know, how a common... Uh, yeah, same thing. Uh, yeah. It is through the humanitarian ground, whatever factor we are getting for free, that we are utilizing for the profile axis. diagnosis uh, uh, for this X chromosomal defect a costly process why it is not a more See, prevalent? all the genetic tests it's cost actually like exactly speaking if they go to commercial labs it will cost around 15 to 18 K okay so if really if the carrier is like planning to have a kid it is worth it is worth doing but uh, screening all the women for carrier status is not worth. But uh, one thing is like we have a huge grant for uh, genetic testing in our hospital. Most of the time the patient genetics can be done free of cost. But it is for the research basis. So it will take time for the reports to come. It, like Usually if you send it to commercial lab it is three weeks. Uh, but here it will take six months. For an antenatal diagnosis, it is not a suitable thing because for a, when the mother is pregnant, you have sent a test. We need test within three or four weeks, right? We cannot wait for six months by the time she will deliver the child only. So for just for the genetic diagnosis of the patient, we can do it on research basis in our medical genetics department. But is it common uh, in taking the family history of a pregnant lady man just in case? Yeah, that is the first step. If they have any bleeding history and all, definitely we should offer for carrier testing. Ma'am, also could you please elaborate on why uh, hemophilia is focused on factor 8 and 9 and not the other ones? Other factors also can be deficient. So, this whatever 13 factor I mentioned, right, the commonest ones are the factor 8, factor 9 because they are the bridge in between the two pathways. Other than that also there is factor 7 deficiency, factor 13 deficiency, factor 11 deficiency, fibrinogen deficiency, all these things are there. But these are called rare factor abnormalities. They are very rare and they are, these genes are on 
autosomes, not on the X chromosome. Everyone will have two normal chromosomes. In that one is abnormal also, you have one more. Unfortunately, males have only X chromosome, that's why they are manifesting hemophilia and B. Understood, no? These are all autosomal recessive. This is X-linked recessive. Okay, so all the factor deficiency is defined. We see, we have in, in our registries also, but because it is X-linked recessive, it is like the manifestations are more. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. I would request uh, Dr. Yogendra Nayak to hand over a memento as a token of appreciation. As this one day uh, symposium comes to an end, I would like to express my appreciation to all the speakers, Dr. Shami, Ms. Preeti, Dr. Prasanna, and Dr. Archana, for their valuable contri contribution to our symposium. I would also like to thank the convener, Dr. Yogendra Nayak, co-convener, Dr. Anup Kishore, our principal, Dr. C. Malikarjuna Rao, and our vice principal, Dr. Krishnamurti Bhatt. I would also like to mention gratitude for our chief guest, Dr. Avinash Shetty, and guests of honor, Rotarian Dr. Jayagauri Hadigal and Rotarian Renu Jairam. Finally, my deepest gratitude to all those who attended this symposium and made it a successful one. Thank you. <laughs>